So it's, it, 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 it's a little bit uh, overwhelming to be on the podium with three dynamic women like this, so I feel a little bit, you know, very small. Um, I, I'm going to give a little bit of a, of a personal account of uh, a journey, really, from, from um, a scientist, I used to be a scientist, to I guess I'm a businessman today, and, and give you a little bit of a flavor of how a, a scientist with a vision can actually bring something potentially to the market, because it's not a trivial exercise. I run Mesoblast, which is a publicly listed company in Australia, trying to develop stem cell-based therapies for a whole range of diseases. And you've heard a little bit from Nadia about what a stem cell is. Uh, we're trying to change treatment paradigms for major conditions, tr aiming to improve quality and, and really survival. And amongst the diseases we're targeting is congestive heart failure. This is the number one cause of uh, hospitalization in the industrialized world. In the United States alone, over 6 million people have heart failure and 670,000 new patients get this disease every year. Uh, the majority of people here in this audience is, is relatively young. We're all trying to become, uh, uh, what was the term, decagenarians? Centenarians. 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 Um, if, if, you, if you get to a ripe old age, at least one in four of you are going to get congestive heart failure, maybe as high as one in two. When you, when your heart, when you lose about 50% of your heart function, the probability of death over about a two-year period is as high as 20%. It's almost like cancer. So what we're trying to do with our company and, and many in the field is really not, not cure the underlying disease, nor, nor are we trying to create a new heart. Rather, we're trying to reset the clock by stimulating the natural healing process, really to rebuild uh, the, the, the heart and other tissues in, in a way that's holistic and in a way that the body knows best. Um, become healthy again and young again. And the transformation really is to try to start from a bad heart to a healthy heart. Now, we're trying to do this in the context of a, of a, of a, of a um, um, framework that fits in with standard business norms. But leading a business enterprise, which my current persona has really evolved from not from a predictable business space, but from a mix of medicine, science, and research. At my core, I'm a physician scientist with a good idea who saw potential and pursued a belief in, in a way that needed to, to, to lead to delivery of change. My start, start is as the child of immigrant parents who, who uh, came here in the 60s and who instilled a spirit of uh, education in me that... Um, that, that required determination and with, with goals that were very highly, highly valued. And I apologize about, about my, my microphone. Um, the, after graduating, and um, sorry, after, uh, after, after graduating uh, from Monash University, where I, where I studied medicine, I thought I'd, I'd get some life experience and I went to New York. Uh, I thought I'd go there for a couple of years and get a rounded education. And um, after 15 years, really, that education was, was quite, uh, quite extraordinary, and it really shaped my professional life. My medical residency was at uh, New York's biggest hospital, Bellevue. It was a life experience that uh, I think is, is second to none in the world. Gunshot wounds, cancers that you only see in textbooks, um, a variety of infectious diseases that are otherwise linked only to, to third world countries, but apparently are still prevalent in uh, New York's poor and underprivileged, quite raw and quite confronting. And against that backdrop, the AIDS epidemic was at its height. Um, if you can believe it, 30% of, uh, of patients at Bellevue in, in, in the 80s um, had AIDS. And in fact, uh, every patient that came into the emergency room had HIV infection until proven otherwise. The destruction of the immune system was my introduction to the world of immunology. And immunology would become my main area of, of uh, career interest, from rebuilding the immune system in AIDS um, to ultimately taming the immune system in autoimmunity and organ transplantation. So that took me really to Columbia, where I was um, running a, a, uh, uh, an immunology group uh, managing heart transplant patients and, and um, leading research in, into a variety of alternative treatments to, to heart disease. The reality was that uh, um, 
supply and demand is a major mismatch uh, in, 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 in patients with this huge unmet need. You know, in, in the US, there's only 3,000 patients who, who uh, get a heart transplant, and there's as many as 60 to 100,000 patients a year who actually could, could, use, could use one. So given that experience, it's no coincidence that Mesoblast's lead pro product aims to, to target congestive heart failure. Um, and it was at Columbia that I, that I got into the emerging field of stem cells, exploring where the bone marrow cells could stimulate regeneration of blood vessels and cardiac muscle cells. So the idea really was, if we didn't, if we didn't have a heart, could we somehow stimulate endogenous, endogenous repair? I, th I think it's the little machine on, on, my, on my hip. Um, in any case, we found some answers early on. And in 2001, In 2001. So the, the point being that we had quite, a, quite an active group uh, in, in cell-based therapy at, at Columbia, and we had some substantial publications, and we had some, some inklings that, um, in some major journals, that in fact we could rebuild the heart muscle and the vasculature. And in those days, that's how really how I met Nadia very early on. But really what I, the, the passion that I had was to see whether the laboratory research that was, that was looking pretty good um, could deliver some human results. So I really wanted to see stem cell tr treatments brought to the clinic. And I figured that that wasn't going to be happening by itself. So how, how really to drive it? Um, the only way to really get it done was to do rigorous science and to, to fit in with the existing framework. Um, and make sure that you did it in a way that was based on evidence-based medicine, not, not, not through a lot of hype that, that many other people have, have um, gone down the path. And clearly, in order to do it in, in an appropriate way, you need a lot of money. And the, the kind of money that, that is needed is really the sort of money that, that drug development demands, um, well beyond the capabilities of any medical research center or any government grant. And at that time, in, in 2001, 2002, pharmaceutical companies, pretty much as, as, as they are today, not ready to take on any futuristic approaches to technologies that threaten to challenge their um, typical dogma of how to, how to treat patients. Standard drug development is about a single drug binding to a single receptor, activating a single pathway. And what we're talking about here are holistic medicines that target multiple pathways, multiple receptors, and trigger a whole cascade of events that results in, in endogenous regeneration or recapitulation of, of, of tissue development. It kind of seems like alchemy. But to me, the analogy is a little bit more like comparing the use of aspirin in a patient who's in intensive care with the 24-7 monitoring that you might get from Dr. McCoy of Star Trek, who zaps and heals with his regenerative device. And the complexity is very much along, along those lines. And from all that, w with a vision to get things going in a much bigger way, September 11 came along. And for those who were there in those days, the devastation, the trauma was really a life-defining moment. And I decided right there that I, I needed to back myself and get going. And, and, you know, you only live once and life is short and, and give it a shot. Um, but the, the, the reality is how do you give it a shot? You need to have some decent technology and you have to have the right backing and you have to have the right infrastructure. So the, the, because I had enough inkling around commercial ventures and around... Um, what the pharmaceutical industry and what investors were looking for, I knew exactly what sort of technology was likely to, to, um, to, to, to uh, work best. What I, what I realized is, apart from having good technology with obviously strong patent protection, what you really need is, is to have Dr. McCoy's Zapper device repackaged to look like aspirin. And the reason for that is because you need to get investors to put up the sort of needed capital to, to, to bring success. Remember that a successful drug uh, today costs a, up to a billion dollars to get to market from, a, from first invention. Secondly, 
you need to be able to thrive commercially as a company with all of the infrastructure and, and cost that goes with that. Thirdly, you need to be able to succeed with the regulatory bodies like the Food, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, um, that ultimately controls the framework of how therapies safely and effectively get to the market. And finally, you need to be able to attract big pharmaceutical companies who ultimately are going to be the ones still that are going to be paying for the final stages of clinical trials, so-called phase three, and who ultimately will be distributing products because they've got the big machinery um, that, that can deliver products to, to, uh, to patients. So I specifically sought out what I thought was going to be the most promising stem cell technology with patent protection and which could be packaged in a way that met my criteria. Now, you all have stem cells in your own bodies. And so an important choice for me was, is it better to take patients' own stem cells, otherwise called autologous cells, and, and create um, personalized medicines? Or, or is it better to try to get something that is off the shelf, um, industrialized, scalable, cheap to, to deliver? The reality is that when you get old enough and sick enough to, to need therapies, you've probably run out of good, a good quality and good numbers of stem cells because what these stem, stem cells do throughout most of your, your lifespan is to respond to external environmental traumas and attacks and protect you. So when you end up with end-stage heart failure, the reality is you probably don't have enough stem cells um, or good quality ones. So paradoxically, a young healthy donor stem cells may be more effective than when you get to end-stage diseases uh, like heart failure than your own. But what about the immune system? That's my field. Right? What, what, what about the barrier that results in rejection of foreign cells? Well, it turns out, in fact, that the kind of cells that we were after have this magic about them that, in fact, they don't recognize by the immune system. They, they, they appear to have a cloak of invisibility. Again, this sort of Star Trek uh, concept. And so um, I put, put my own personal money into this venture, and I was able to convince uh, a couple of friends, a, a medical friend of mine, as well as a, a serious investor, to raise some capital, license technology that we thought was extremely promising from world-leading Australian stem cell biologists, and set up what is, what is otherwise now call, called mesoblasts. It wasn't mesoblasts at the beginning, but it's now mesoblasts. Um, and that brought me back to Australia. From there, in December 2004, mesoblast was listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, raised about $20 million, and on and on, here we are eight years later, I can tell you Mesoblast today is the world's largest regenerative medicine company. We've got about $200 million in the bank, uh, and we've got a market capitalization of over $1.5 billion. And I guess I paid down my own credit card. Um, but I guess the, 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 the point that I'm trying to make is that Mesoblast has flourished in an industry where failure is actually the norm. The chance of success at the beginning of phase two is only one in five. The, at, the end, at the beginning of phase three is still only one in two. And currently we've got about nine clinical trials going on at phases two and phases three. Lots of risk, but it's all about risk mitigation and we can talk about that in the question and answer sessions, et cetera. But I, I guess the point is that if you've got a vision, um, you want to back yourself, if you, ha you have to understand what the pitfalls and what the risks are, but you want to do it properly and with integrity. And circling back to what we've done in the last eight years, where, where are we today? We started with heart failure as the, as the example, as a case study. Well, just to give you, uh, you know, it's, taken, it's taken eight years to do a manufacturing processing, to go through the right regulatory channels, to go through animal studies, etc. We've just completed a 60 patient phase two trial. And the patients who received a single dose of our uh, unique types of stem cells Three years later, after a single injection, have had not one episode of hospitalization, nor one episode of death, whereas the control patients have had a 25% event rate. Now, is that important? Well, it's highly significant. Um, is it real? Who knows? We need to do a phase three trial, appropriately powered, appropriately statistically uh, driven, and we'll answer that question in the next couple of years. In, in the meantime, we've done it the right way, with integrity, with a lot of capital behind us, and we've now got a big pharmaceutical partner that, that, that is our partner in this, in this phase three program, and we'll, and we'll see. And you've got to address it the right way, and um, whether this thing works or doesn't work, I think remains an unknown, but we're certainly giving ourselves the best opportunity. Right. Thank you. <laughs>